Welcome back everyone to another episode of Space This Week. Every single Monday I bring you these quick video updates to fill you in on all the latest space news, launch events and Starship updates from the past week. We have lots to talk about once again from all things Starship to the successful NASA capstone mission as well as successful launches from SpaceX, India, China, United Launch Alliance and Virgin Orbit. Stay tuned. Anyway, on with the video. What's in the box? Oh, what's in the box? Was a question we were all asking ourselves a few weeks ago, while SpaceX were fabricating this mysterious contraption. We since learned that this mystery object is the machine that loads the V2 Starlink satellites into a starship. We don't really know exactly how it works, but I imagine it's similar to how an industrial pallet stacker operates, given that SpaceX engineers based much of the deployment mechanism inside the Starship on pallet stacking technology. It's since had its rusty exterior given a fresh coat of white paint, and on Thursday, SpaceX mounted it to the side of Ship 24 for the first time. I highly doubt anything was actually unloaded from the box into the ship, Starlink satellite or dummy payload. This was probably some kind of fit test. As you can see, it was lifted using the high bay bridge crane rather than a mobile crane, which means that there's a chance that this design is final, and it'll be how SpaceX loads Starlink satellites into ships once Starship and Starlink V2 are fully operational. In with the new, out with the old, unfortunately. Last week, SpaceX began the dismantling and ultimate scrapping of Booster 5. A real shame, Booster 5 was only the second Super Heavy to be completely assembled with grid fins and all that, but since it was only able to support the now defunct Raptor 1 engine, an engine that SpaceX no longer produced, Booster 5 was left with no purpose in this world. May it fly many launches in that big launch pad in the sky. Ugh, that was, that was dumb. Anyway, speaking of retired Super Heavies, Booster 4 was removed from the launch site and rolled back to the build area. Booster 4 was, of course, destined to be the first stage of the first ever orbital flight test for Starship, carrying Ship 20 all the way to orbit. However, these vehicles were, once again, powered by Raptor 1, and while each of them had had their engines installed, SpaceX eventually decided that there was little point in launching a rocket with such outdated technology. So many improvements and advances in both the engines and vehicles themselves have been made since the first rollout of Booster 4 and Ship 20. But Booster 4 and Ship 20 will always hold the title of being the first ship and booster combo to be fully stacked, both with cranes and then later on with the launch tower catch arms. Ship 20 is currently at the scrapyard in the spot where the late SN16 once stood. And I wonder if SpaceX will ultimately just scrap Booster 4 and Ship 20, or if they'll preserve them and possibly put them on display. It would be a shame to lose such a monumental machine after all. What do you think SpaceX will do? Scrap or not scrap? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. And hey, while you're down there, be sure to drop a like and a subscription on the video if you're enjoying today's flight. It really helps me out and I always do appreciate it. We finally started seeing some development updates for the two ill-fated vertical methane tanks at the tank farm. The big vertical tanks, best seen in this kinda outdated now drone shot, supply the Starship rocket with propellant. However, these two here were designed for the storage of liquid methane, and it turned out that they weren't in compliance with Texas law with regards to the storage of methane. In response, SpaceX installed all of these compliant horizontal tanks, and ever since then we've been wondering what they're going to do with the defunct vertical tanks. Well, it looks like they're converting them into water tanks, possibly to feed the massive water deluge system for the launch pad. We'll get confirmation of this in the next few weeks, I'm sure, as SpaceX rapidly ramp up to the static fire and ultimate launch of Booster 7 and Ship 24. Down at the Roberts Road site, SpaceX are truly moving at warp 9 in getting their second Starship facility built. Sean caught this picture of some catch arm components being shipped down to the site, and Lolo Matico 3D keeps us all updated on the progress of the launch pad and tower with their excellent regular infographics on Twitter. Here's their latest post of where we are. As you can see, the tower is now three segments tall, with another four on standby ready to be transported to the site. I think the biggest news we got from the Starship program last week was these two images shared by SpaceX. Here is the bottom of Booster 7. All 33 Raptor 2 engines are there and they're all ready for launch. And here is the underside of Ship 24. Yes, all six Raptor engines have been installed. The three central sea level Raptor engines and the larger three vacuum Raptor engines. Some of you might be wondering why the inside of the engine nozzles all look a little bit different. 
The reason for this is because all of these engines have been test fired and it's likely that some have been fired more times and or for longer periods of time than others, resulting in differences in scorch marking. I imagine that over time, as SpaceX nails down the production and test process, we'll start seeing the internals of the engine nozzles start looking a little bit more uniform. One thing that might have caught your attention are these two things here. I'm not 100% certain of this, so if you know, then let me know in the comments down below, but I believe these are two drainage ports, one for liquid oxygen and one for liquid methane, and they are there to fully flush the tanks and plumbing with nitrogen before fueling can begin. Another theory is that these are all chill vents for the central Raptor 2 engines, which will get substantially hotter than the outer engines. What are your thoughts on these though? Let me know in the comment section down below. The biggest launch event we saw last week was undoubtedly the Rocket Lab NASA capstone mission, which launched on Tuesday. The capstone mission name is an acronym that stands for <clears throat> Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System Technology Operations and Navigation Experiment. In short, the capstone is a 12-unit CubeSat that will be the first spacecraft to test the near-rectilinear halo orbit around the moon, which will be the same orbit to be used by the Lunar Gateway Space Station, a moon orbiting station that will provide essential support for NASA's Artemis program, serving long-term astronaut lunar missions. Capstone will test and verify the calculated orbital stability of the station's planned orbit, spending at least six months collecting data during its mission, flying within 1,000 miles of the Moon's North Pole on its near pass, and 43,500 miles from the South Pole at its farthest. In addition to its primary mission objective, the spacecraft will also test a new navigation system called the Cislunar Autonomous Positioning System, i.e. the CAPS part of the word capstone, which will measure the spacecraft's position relative to the NASA Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter without relying on ground stations. So how did the launch go? Well, very well, so far. Rocket Lab's Electron is very small. It's too small to launch a spacecraft that can just do one giant burn to the moon in one go, for example, like the Apollo missions. Instead, the Capstone satellite will ride on Rocket Lab's Photon Kickstage, which will gradually raise the satellite's orbit into a lunar transfer over the course of six days with multiple burns at perigee, taking full advantage of the Oberth effect. Within 20 minutes of the final burn, Photon will release the spacecraft, which will continue on to the moon, making small adjustments as needed to its orbit using its onboard thrusters. Unfortunately, there was no recovery attempt for the Electron's first stage, nor were there any cameras on board in order to maximize the rocket's performance by keeping all weight down to an absolute minimum. I can't wait to watch the continued success of the Capstone mission, and it's going to be awesome to see the Lunar Gateway Station come together one day. SpaceX pulled off another successful Falcon 9 launch on Wednesday, Day. This was the SES-22 mission, which launched the SES-22 C-band satellite to geostationary orbit. The SES-22 is owned by SESSA, a satellite network provider based in Luxembourg, and it weighs around 3.5 metric tons and has a lifespan of 15 years. Its primary mission is to provide North America with digital broadcasting services and bolster continuing efforts of clearing the lower 300 megahertz of C-band spectrum necessary to make room for 5G enabled services for the United States. The SES-22 mission is a big step towards this goal. So far, SES has managed to clear about a third of the C-band spectrum in the important parts of the US by reprioritizing and reorienting existing networks. And the SES-22 launch, and two more launches to follow, will allow them to completely clear the C-band spectrum. The SES-22 satellite should start providing Americans with 5G service by August 2022. Perhaps you might end up using it to watch space this week. Now, as for the Falcon 9 rocket itself, it was another textbook launch and landing. We got another clean, uninterrupted view of the touchdown of the booster on the drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas. Speaking of SpaceX stuff, last week they received approval from the FCC to allow them to provide Starlink satellite internet service on cars, RVs, trucks, boats, and planes while they're in motion. This is a big step for SpaceX, who can now begin operating satellite internet services for airlines JSX and Hawaiian Airlines, as well as on Royal Caribbean's cruise ships. I'd be very surprised if we don't see this list of customers start to increase, and perhaps one day good internet on airplanes will be the norm. 
so you can watch my Kerbal Space Program videos while on the go. Wow, amazing self-promotion. Anyway, last week on Monday, China launched a Long March 4C rocket, which carried a single GFN 1203 satellite to low Earth orbit. The GFN 1203 is a microwave remote sensing satellite capable of providing photographs with a greater than one meter resolution. Now, for Americans watching, this is a resolution greater than the length of 5.6 Taco Bell Crunchwrap Supremes. Now, according to official sources, GFN 1203 will be mainly used in land surveys, urban planning, determining and registering land rights, road network design, crop yield estimates, and disaster prevention and relief. We had a launch from India last week, and I can't show you the footage because the Indian government will copyright claim this video, so enjoy whatever is on screen instead. The Indian Space Research Organization launched a PSLV rocket in its CA configuration, which stands for Core Alone, i.e. no side boosters, and the rocket carried three satellites, all for customers in Singapore to low Earth orbit. Two of the satellites are for Earth observation, and the third payload was the first satellite in the Student Satellite Series, from Singapore's NTU School of Electrical and Electrical engineering. The PSLV orbital experiment module, which was carrying six hosted payload, was attached to the upper stage of the rocket. On the 1st of July, United Launch Alliance launched an Atlas V. This happened a day later than planned due to stormy weather. Tori Bruno confirmed on Twitter that in order to launch, they needed to have 30 minutes without a lightning strike, but they just couldn't get even a few minutes on Thursday. Luckily, Friday carried more favorable weather, and the trusty Atlas V rocket took to the skies from the Kennedy Space Center, carrying the Wide Field of View Experimental Missile Warning Satellite for the US Space Force. The Wide Field of View satellite features a new type of infrared staring sensor, which it will use to detect the heat from missile launch plumes. The mission also included some additional rideshare payloads, but not a lot has been disclosed about what these are. But the payloads are likely technology demonstration platforms. Virgin Orbit achieved their first ever night launch last week. This took place on Saturday and was once again an air launch of their Launcher 1 SmallSat rocket, which was released from under the wing of the Cosmic Girl carrier aircraft. Since this was at night, the B-roll isn't that interesting, so here's some footage of an older launch. <laughs> the rocket carried seven satellites from multiple US government agencies, which are experiments intended to demonstrate novel modular satellite bus, space domain awareness, and adaptive radio frequency technologies. NASA has given us one heck of a tease for the upcoming release of the first James Webb Space Telescope images. These are going to publicly release in less than two weeks now, and the scientists have said that the images from the telescope nearly brought them to tears. And that's it. That's that's the news. I mean, to be honest, I almost wish we hadn't heard anything from them. It's just going to make waiting for the images to release to the public even more agonizing now than it already was. Here's hoping they live up to the hype. I got to give a huge thanks to all the names scrolling on the left of your screen. They are my channel members and Patreon supporters, and it's their generosity that makes this content possible. A lot of the footage and photos I show aren't free, and your continued support allows me to keep up with licensing fees and supporting the photographers that supply us with all of this juicy content. Sign up to either scheme using the links below or on screen, and be sure to check out either of the two video suggestions if they look interesting. 